The movie by Spike Lee, Black Klansman, shines a light on American racial history and even on our present. We'll be talking about the significance of that with Baylor University English professor Greg Garrett on Good God. Stay tuned. Welcome to Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. I'm your host, George Mason, and I'm pleased to welcome to the program today, Greg Garrett. Greg, good to have you with us. Oh, it's such a pleasure, George. Thank you. Greg is a professor of English for the past 30 years at Baylor mm -hmm. University, and he has written widely, but also taught not only on literature generally and writing, but also uh, on the the subject of race. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we're going to have a conversation in this episode, Greg, about uh, race generally, but uh, also the fact that we have just concluded a morning here at Wilshire Baptist Church where you showed the film Black Klansman by Spike Lee, mm -hmm. and we had a fairly diverse group of people right. uh, represented watching it and then having conversation about it. Uh, a remarkable film, really yeah. uh, a, a, an emotionally um, power-packed film, uh, one that sheds light on our history as Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it really is uh, one of Spike Lee's most provocative and profound films, I think, don't you think? It, it absolutely is. And uh, when the film came out, there was this critical s consensus that formed rapidly around it that it was Spike Lee at the very top of his gifts. Yes. Um, not just as a storyteller and a filmmaker, but also as a provocateur. Yes. Um, because many of his films are intended to sort of hold up a mirror mm -hmm. to American society and, and make us look at ourselves. and. Um, see ourselves in ways that we don't normally want to think about mm -hmm, ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and that's certainly what Black Klansman does because it takes us into the sort of uh, underbelly of um, white Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. which is you know, so powerful and, and, and dangerous right now in our culture, and gives us a sense of the very sort of reasonable ideas that they have about why they're doing what they're doing and how they often actually co-opt elements of our faith as a, a way of um, making arguments for uh, keeping white men particularly supreme. And, and so it's, it's an incredibly powerful film that, uh, as we were saying this morning, also involves us emotionally to the extent that we may be able to get past the difficulty we sometimes have in thinking and talking mm -hmm. about race. Right. So this film is set in the 1970s, and it's mm -hmm. based upon a true story, uh, although it's been broadly reinterpreted and characters placed in it and whatnot. But uh, but, but on the other hand, it 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 you mentioned uh, in the in the lead into it that while it is a period film, someone mm -hmm. uh, in in a review made the comment that that period is always right, uh, which is to say, uh, as Faulkner said, the past is never past, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that really uh, this is a recurring theme in American history that mm -hmm. is profoundly still with us that is unresolved. But it does feel in some ways like at least it is now something we can see. Yeah. And this film helps us to see it anew, but it's out in the open and it's not nearly as undercover as it has been. Would you agree or disagree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that the film does is it, it it tells us that these recurring problems that we've had throughout American history are our problems. Yes. They're the problems that go to the heart of who we are as, as a people. Mm -hmm. And he uses history in, in thoughtful ways in the film to do that. He makes a lot of references uh, to the 1915 uh, epic, Birth of a Nation, mm -hmm. uh, which has uh, incredible emotional power, even to this day. I showed it last week to a graduate seminar at mm -hmm. Baylor. Mm -hmm. and even though I had warned my students in advance, uh, they, they talked about how seductive the film is right. because of its cinematic power. Yes. And so uh, we've got uh, that film that reappears at different times uh, during the course of, of Black Klansmen. We've got uh, reference made to the history of the Klan, mm -hmm. uh, the organization as they call themselves yes. in this film. And uh, then we're told about the, um, the lynching that took place in 1916 in Waco, Texas. Right. 
um, a very real event, which is narrated by a character played by Harry, Harry Belafonte right. in the film. And it's, it's emotionally wrenching. Uh, and then we see some of the pictures from the lynching itself. And we're just reminded, you know, this is an ongoing issue at the heart of, of who we are. And if we don't confront it, it will continue. Yes. And, and that's why this is a movie that is a, a period movie, but as the critic said, the period is now. It's always. So we, the movie begins with Gone with the Wind, mm -hmm. scene from Gone with the Wind. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people uh, view Gone with the Wind as this really epic movie that is, you know, just part of our American film history and right. all of that. But it really was quite deliberately part of the lost cause narrative, mm -hmm. the uh, sort of reinvention of the South and the, uh, the, the sense of victimization that uh, the South and, and white people experienced as a result of the Civil War. And, and, and so that, along with Birth of the Nation, are part of the film history that, that didn't just depict, but also actually increased the racial racializing of American society yeah. and the uh, Jim Crow laws that come about in mm -hmm. our society and things of that nature. So film sometimes doesn't just reflect how things are, but it also then uh, reinforces and, and, and supports a cause. It, it can support ideologies that are yes. already in place. Right. And um, you and I talked about uh, this on the dais uh, during worship the last time I was here. Mm -hmm. and. The, um, the idea that we came up with that sort of we formulated from the conversation we had had about film last time and, mm -hmm. um, and, and during worship was that film is one of our cultural uh, artifacts that has mythic powers. Yes. And when I use the word myth, I don't use it in the sort of uh, downgraded sort of way that we think mm -hmm. of, oh, it, this is mm -hmm. false and artificial. Right. But in the way that we think of, um, this is absolutely true. Yes. You know, even if you can't quantify it in a scientific way, mm -hmm. myth is a way that people understand the world. Right. And so what we talked about uh, last time I was here, we said we need to identify the myths that are soul killing mm -hmm. and claim and celebrate the myths that are life giving. Yes. And so these myths that are reflected in Birth of a Nation and mostly uh, reflected through uh, things like Gone with the Wind are mm -hmm. powerful and dangerous racial stereotypes. Yes. Um, so when black characters or people who are outside the white mainstream are represented, mm -hmm. they, are, they are represented somehow as less than or other. Right. And there is this very clear hierarchical sense that's enforced mm -hmm. in this story or in the story of, of Birth of a Nation, where we have the myth of white superiority um, supported in a powerful artistic way. Yes. And, and so that's one of the dangers and one of the reasons that I started writing about film was because it seemed really important that we draw attention to things like Gone with the Wind. Yes. Uh, Gone with the Wind is shown uh, every summer during the uh, film series at the Paramount, my native Austin, the, mm -hmm. uh, the beautiful, you know, kind of classic uh, picture palace. And it seems very important to me that uh, when we see a film like that, we have to question it and ask about its context and ask how it can be reinforcing harmful things for us. Right. So we've got to be conscious consumers yes. of the media and the literature, the stories that are put in front of us. It would be easy, I think, for us to view Black Klansmen as a Spike Lee joint, a film mm -hmm. by Spike Lee, and therefore uh, categorize it as a black film. Mm. Um, and, and probably it's been seen, my guess is, more by uh, black Americans than by white Americans uh, because we easily might dismiss it as such. Right. Uh, but this film is uh, so deeply important, I think, for white people to see mm -hmm. and come to grips with. In what ways do you think that's so? Well, I think one of the things that it does for us, you know, we talked about how Spike Lee holds up a mirror. And um, he holds it up to the entire society. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he often deals with is the fact that prejudice is not solely our uh, mm -hmm. province as, as white males. Mm -hmm. uh, we get the most out of it. Yes. Um, but it, it's something that uh, we all wrestle with. And uh, to draw that to people's attention can be an important thing. He does that in some of the other films. But I think the most important thing about this film is how it weaves together the 
the past story, the story set in the 70s, with our, our story that's set in the present. And I'm always reluctant to reveal too much about the end of, of Black course. Klansman right. because it's such a powerful emotional experience. But I, I would say that one of the most important things that happens to every viewer is this shock of recognition yes. when they realize that we have moved from a story set in the past that we have been treating as fictional to our reality at mm -hmm. this moment mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. white supremacists walk the streets. Openly. Openly. Without hoods. Without hoods. Exactly. And but carrying torches. And, and the other thing I would say about why it's really important for a white audience to see this is that I think that this is a movie which is such a powerful emotional experience that it can break open mm -hmm. um, people who have not been open to having the hard conversations about race and prejudice in this country. Right. Uh, when we talked about it a while ago, I mean, there were, there were powerful emotions all around the room, and I was expressing mm -hmm. plenty of them. Um, but there's also this sense that because we have been cracked open in some way, um, something can enter into that. Yes. And we have this idea that um, maybe we will be more open uh, to having these hard conversations, more open to acknowledging our responsibility yes. as, as citizens in a racist society. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have showed this film often, and I have never not shown it where people have not had first a powerful emotional experience and then really important conversation as a result of it. So I think that that's what this film could launch. We were talking about the referentialism of the film with other films, the way Spike Lee you know, brings in other genres of films mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. And we, we had lots of conversation about the black black exploitation films, mm -hmm. for instance, the buddy films, the, you know, the original, um, The Gone with the Wind and Birth of the Nation. The one we didn't talk about that I think is so interesting and fascinating is The Big Lebowski. <laughs> so here we have two characters, Walter and Donnie, who's not named in this film, mm -hmm. but played by Steve Buscemi's brother in yeah, the film. That's true. And mm -hmm. the Big Lebowski film is about mistaken identity, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but it's also a kind of a cult white film, you right. might say, right? Right. And, and and the fact that Spike Lee chooses to to create these characters. I mean, to me, this mm -hmm. is sort of another way in for white people. Oh, uh, that's brilliant. It, in, in terms of looking at how we, we, we're some of us who, you know, might have seen that movie over and over again, we're like, oh, look what he's doing there. Yeah. Oh, the mistaken identity. Oh, you know, the, the braggadocia, the, you know, uh, all of this sort of thing that's mm -hmm. going on in the white world, you know. Uh, a, amazing uh, gesture, I think, to bring everybody into the film. And one of the things we talked about is that Spike Lee is an incredibly cinema literate person. Yes. He's yeah. part of this generation of film school trained directors. Right. right. And he actually still teaches in the NYU film program. Yes. And um, so it would not surprise me any conscious reference. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had talked earlier about all of these different genres that he's using. And uh, I, I think that any kind of access point that people can find in terms of stories they're familiar with. Right. Uh, because, you know, even though I'd read a little bit about the film when I f saw it for the first time here in Dallas yeah. in, in 1918, I didn't know what to expect. Right. You know, I knew it was a Spike Lee film and I was on board with that. Right. Um, but if you come in and you think, okay, well, this is a historical story or a detective story or a, a buddy story. Right. Like, okay, I've seen Lethal Weapon. I like Lethal Weapon. Right, right. Well, I could probably sit and watch this. So yeah. it, it does feel like he is making a way in for people based on their past movie experience. Yes, yes. Well, I, I want to come back to this in, in the next segment uh, because uh, although I'd like to move beyond Black Klansmen, I think it's really important for us to, to talk a little bit, bit about the, um, the, the technique of bringing the Jewish character mm. into it and the whole concept of intersectionality yeah. that this film brilliantly uh, invites us to consider uh, as a result of that as well. So let's take a break and we'll come back and continue this conversation. The Good God Program is a project of Faith Commons, a nonprofit organization I founded in 2018 to help promote the common good. 
doing public theology across faith traditions and across racial and ethnic lines is an important thing today in our communities. We hope you'll continue to enjoy Good God, but look at some of the other things we're doing also through Faith Commons at www.faithcommons.org. We're back with Greg Garrett, and we've been talking, Greg, about Black Klansmen, this brilliant Spike Lee film. It is a Spike Lee film, but the screenplay was actually written uh, by two Jewish uh, screenplay writers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I assume it's their invention to place a Jewish character right. into the story that originally didn't have a, a Jewish character in it. Right. Um, the, the basic idea, of course, in Colorado Springs Police Department is an African-American officer who finds a way to infiltrate the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable story. It seems almost ridiculous, but it actually happened. Right. Uh, but in the film, there's this decision to use as the uh, uh, sort of the plant mm -hmm. uh, the, in, in the Klan a white character who is Jewish. Mm -hmm. So this really goes to something of this notion of what's called by sociologists now intersectionality. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit generally and what you think is happening in the film to help understand that concept? And, and by intersectionality, are we talking about the sort of bifurcation that happens where people have to live yes. one part of their life Right, so, so there's th this, this notion of intersectionality is a, a concept that seems to be more and more in racial studies mm -hmm. uh, and, and in, in social studies, where we are coming to recognize that our identities have a, a kind of certain privilege in certain areas, mm -hmm. but maybe not in other areas. And so, for example, an African-American male might have a sense of living with racial oppression mm -hmm. on, on the one hand, but having a kind of privilege, on the other hand, over African-American females, say, right. for instance, right. or uh, some such thing. So here we have a Jewish character who, on the one hand, has this privilege as a white character, right. uh, but now set in this uh, setting with the Klan, uh, is sort of alerted to his Jewishness and the fact that he's uh, struggling with that identity that he hadn't struggled with before he gets exactly. in this. So here we are, in other words, I think the, the whole concept is no matter where you are in the social system, you are never one thing or another. Right. I mean, even if you are a, a, a white Protestant person in, in America, there is a sense that you might have suffered abuse in your home growing up, mm -hmm. or you, you know, might have been working class, or yeah. you, something of that nature. So we're coming to understand that we should all pay attention, both to our privilege, but also to the ways that we can be sensitive right. to other people's struggles as well. I think that was one of the great creative decisions. And um, I did have the privilege of interviewing David Rabinowitz, who was one of the two original writers working Good. with Ron Stallworth on adapting his memoir. Right. And there's a long and really interesting story attached to that. Um, Ron basically trusted these guys who had never had a movie made, mm -hmm. didn't sign a contract and just said, you know, if we ever get to this place, yeah. that would be awesome. And then uh, they finished uh, their screenplay, which did include that character of Philip or Flip. Yes. Um, and uh, sent it to Jordan Peele, the mm -hmm. uh, director of Get Out. Right. And he said, I know exactly who needs to make this movie and wow. put it in the hands of Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. But David and his partner created this character who is at this intersection of um, being um, treated in a certain way if he embraces this piece of his identity. Mm -hmm. and treated in a certain way because he's never had to think about his identity. Right. But what the members of the Klan, uh, particularly this really terrifying character named Felix, keeps bringing up, keeps confronting him about if he's Jewish. Mm. Yes. And he, he literally is having to deny, 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 deny. Three times maybe? Probably so. <laughs> and so, as he says in the movie, um, when, when the character of Ron, who's played uh, by Denzel Washington's son, uh, confronts him and says, why, why are you acting like you don't have skin in the game? Right. You're Jewish. Yes. And uh, he 
during the course of the movie begins to realize that he has done this thing that some of the African American folks in our conversation this morning were saying, uh, you know, talking about passing. Yes. You know, if you're a light-skinned black person, you can pass. Yes. And and not have to mm -hmm. deal with this part of your identity where mm -hmm. you'll be held down and looked down on. And so it's a really brilliant thing that they've done in the movie, but what I think the movie ends up doing with the character of Flip is he becomes fully himself yes. because he's able to embrace that part of himself that he's denied for so long. Right. And it actually takes him not to this place of prejudice, which is not to say that he will not be subjected to anti-Semitism if he embraces it fully, but to this place where he realizes that the wisdom and the ritual that he has lost because he has not embraced that part of himself is mm -hmm. an important thing that he wants yes. for himself. Uh, it, it's a really lovely movie, and, and Spike Lee doesn't often do uh, a storyline about religion, but this is a really important right. storyline about faith. So here in Dallas, the new Holocaust Museum uh, has been um, opened, and they made a very deliberate decision to call it uh, the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Mm. And uh, recently, when Governor Abbott made the decision to opt out of the federal resettlement program for refugees in Texas. Right. Uh, the Holocaust and Human Rights Museum stepped up to say uh, that this coming out of a Jewish experience, we need to stand up for the rights of those who are not Jewish, but who are right. similarly uh, being imperiled by this rejection. Yeah. It seems to me that this is an example of how in this film and how generally mm -hmm. we need to be approaching these matters, that there is a particularity of everyone's individual experience that must be honored and recognized, right. not co-opted or appropriated, right? Uh, but yet we can't stay only within the confines of our own suffering and experience right. and privilege it to such an extent that there's no empathy, there's no compassion, there's no, there's no advocacy for someone else, right? And this, this gets to, I think, some of the, the question of what are two white guys like us doing sitting here talking about race? Well, we had some conversation about that earlier after the film. And it's a conversation I've had to have often over the last four or five years mm -hmm. uh, because I've spent all of this time working on a book, mm -hmm. uh, convening these film uh, screenings and conversations. And the reasons I thought I needed to be doing this when I started are not necessarily the reasons I felt I feel like I need to do them now. Okay. One of the things that's become clearer and clearer to me as time has passed is that I think white people of good conscience often sit back and allow people of color to advance the conversation about racism, mm -hmm. even though they are the people who are most vulnerable mm -hmm. and most in danger. Right. And one of the things that's become clear to me is that out of my privilege as a white middle class working, mm -hmm. you know, uh, professional mm -hmm. male, um, I, I don't face that same kind of danger or ridicule. Yes. There may be some people shaking their heads and saying, you know, why don't you stay in your lane? Yes. But I think ultimately the other thing is that at the end of the day, it is all of our lanes. Yes. It's the thing about us all having skin in the game. Exactly. Um, because I have this very strong sense that I cannot be who I'm called to be while someone else is held in oppression. Right. Um, Dr. King used to say that until all of us are free, None, None of, of us, us is free. are free. And there's that, that very powerful sense that I am still in bondage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as long as any of my brothers or sisters are in any kind of bondage. Yes, right. Um, so to, to be the people that we are called to be, and you know, for me to be a good Christian, a good citizen, mm -hmm. and I certainly put them in that order, Yes. Um, I have got to speak out on behalf of my brothers and sisters who would find it more difficult to do so. Yes. And to use the platforms that I have and the teaching and writing that I have available to me in order to continue this conversation that has begun has been begun by by martyrs and heroes. So I think when Barack Obama was elected president, uh, he represented hope to a lot of white people who actually voted for him mm -hmm. and then voted for Donald Trump. Yes. There was a sense 
of what we call moral licensing mm -hmm. that took place, where someone could say, well, I voted for Obama, but mm -hmm. he disappointed me. And one of the disappointments you hear from white people who then voted for Donald Trump is that he didn't fix the racial problem. Right. He didn't solve it. He, here, if we could just elect a black president, mm -hmm. uh, then he will tell black people that it's over and that it's done. But instead, when he stood up for Jordan Edwards, mm -hmm. uh, when, when he uh, stood up for uh, you know, uh, various uh, young men mm -hmm. who, were, uh, who were killed and said, you know, that could have been my son or yeah. something Trayvon like that. Martin. Uh, Trayvon Martin as well. Uh, you know, then he, he disappointed them because mm -hmm. instead he was race baiting. He was, he was re-racializing instead of solving. Right. So what's your take on, on and how all of that took place? I, I think that that is a really important thing for us to call attention to because I think a lot of us, me included, yeah. had the hope that maybe we were now in a different space racially. Right. Um, one of the things that I've discovered in my research is that all of this moves in waves. Yeah. And, and we can talk about, as, as Dr. King did, the, the idea of the arc of the, the moral universe. Right. Um, but our response to racism and prejudice seems to be cyclical and, and you know, a step forward, a step back, two steps forward, a step yes. back, or as right now, three steps back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so we actually probably should have predicted yeah. that if a black person right. was elected president and didn't act like a white person yes. or act as the white people who voted for him thought that he ought to, right. that there would be yes. a, a backlash in response to that. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think one of the things that we wrestle with now is that there are still people who think, well, we've ticked this box yes. and we don't have to talk about race anymore. Right. And I mean, clearly that is untrue because we, uh, we know from the newspaper every day yes. that you know there is there is some horror happening somewhere uh, in the country, but there there are people who believe that you know we've we've achieved parity, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I don't know why people of color are still angry. Yes, and why do they have to say Black Lives Matter? All lives matter. Right, which is right. actually what we heard chanted at Charlottesville. We did, in fact. <laughs> um, so this gets to the matter uh, that you talked about a little while earlier in our church setting with Black Klansmen about the different uh, arenas of sin. Yeah. Uh, that is to say there's uh, the, the personal, the social, and the institutional. Often mm -hmm. we group the social and institutional mm -hmm. uh, as, as one group. Jesse Jackson likes to say uh, that there's uh, the sin within and the sin we're in. Yeah. And yeah. Most often, white Americans focus on the sin within. Right. And not the sin we're in. The social and institutional aspects of racism that have to still be unmasked and recognized mm -hmm. as affecting our everyday lives uh, in powerful ways. What would you say to uh, those who are watching or listening to this program would be some concrete steps, ways to go beyond the personal and, right. and recognize uh, the involvement in social and institutional racism? And I think that is, as you say, the, the big question because many of us are just happy to say, well, I don't think I'm racist. Right. I'm not part of the problem. Right. But you know, we benefit every day Right. from being in this hierarchical mm -hmm. uh, society that's, that's been set up in which we are privileged and other people are dispossessed yes. in various ways. Um, so I think one of the things that came out of our conversation earlier this morning after the film was just first this very powerful sense that I can act. Yes. And even though I had some side conversations with people who said, you know, I, I don't feel like it's enough. I don't feel like it's enough. Um, what I said to all of those people is it's not nothing. <laughs> ah, there you go, okay. Just you know, to, to speak up first about the, the fact that we continue to live in a society where some people benefit inordinately yes. and other people are held down uh, mm -hmm. to benefit those people. Right. Um, so to talk about it, to bring it out in, uh, into the open is I think a major thing. Um, and of course, 
we had uh, one of your uh, residents uh, or past residents this morning said, you know, we need to organize. Yes. How, how is it possible that these thousands of, of uh, white supremacists can show up in one place and all, the best we can do is, you know, a ragtag band of holy warriors <laughs> exactly. to, you know, to thumb their noses at them. Right. We've, we've got to, uh -huh. to, to have some kind of organization. To be anti-racist. To be anti-racist. Not just not racist, yes. but anti-racist. Yeah, it's, it's not just for us to stand over and go, hey, we're not like them. Right. But to say, hey, we don't want to be a part of this thing right. anymore. Right. And then, you know, the big kind of macro level is there are still a lot of laws and policies on mm -hmm. the books mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that hold people in a state of oppression. Yes. And um, until those are addressed, until those systemic things are held up to the light and, mm -hmm. and claimed and, and we feel some shame for them, Yes. and remorse for them. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as the system is allowed to exist invisibly underground, right. then it doesn't matter if we personally are racist or not, right. because the culture is going to continue ticking along without us. Greg, I can't tell you how great it is to have you here, and thank you for being on Good God to talk about these things. You're so very welcome. More than that, thank you for continuing to shine the light on these, these matters too. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you. Oh,